Okay, welcome everybody to CC Animal Health's Continuing Education. We're glad you could join us this evening. Our topic this evening is non-pharma pain tools for emergency and ICU use. And our presenter is Jennifer Johnson. Uh, Dr. Johnson has been a small animal veterinarian for 27 years, owning and operating a busy practice in the Philadelphia suburbs. Focusing on pain management early in her career, Dr. Johnson achieved certified veterinary pain practitioner qualifies from the International Veterinary Academy of Pain Management. We call that IVEPM. And she speaks nationally, teaching the importance of multimodal analgesia in the veterinary medicine world. Now Lou relocated to Fountain Hills, Arizona. Jennifer is the current president of IVAPM and also serves on the board of Eagle Econdor, providing medical and surgical care for animals in Ecuador. We welcome Dr. Johnson. Thank you. And um, thank you everyone for taking time out tonight to uh, be with me for an hour. I'm excited to be here and talk to you uh, about uh, pain management, because that's my favorite topic uh, to educate about. Um, I do want to thank ACC for inviting me. And um, before we start, I do want to give a little plug for the IVAPM, um, AVAPM. And um, if you have not heard of us, check out our website. We are um, a very active organization, uh, totally interested in pain management and teaching educating about veterinary pain management. Uh, we do sponsor uh, September Pet Animal Pain Awareness Month, and there's a lot of information about that as well, as well as the certification process. So uh, go on to the website. Thank you. Um, so today for the next hour, I kind of want to take a little ride uh, with a little real world clinical application. I want to remind you of the importance of aggressive pain management in nursing of your patients, um, proof that it really reduces morbidity and mortality in the patients that you see in hospital. And I really do want to support and celebrate uh, what you're doing in your hospitalized patients, um, but also investigate the big biggest objection and some of the proof behind what we can do to provide better pain management options to our patients when they're in the hospital and um, supported with some evidence as well and some solutions. So starting out with relevance, why is this topic relevant? I mean, you know why it's relevant. Certainly we're all looking for ways to improve the health and welfare of our patients. And we know that pain is a multi-dimensional phenomenon uh, with physical, but also genetic and psychological factors that all contribute contribute to the ultimate outcome in our patient. And we're always looking for multimodal um, options for the treatment of pain. Uh, so there's the relevance there and also the idea that this is important, right? Why is pain management important? Well, looking at these patients, you can tell right away that why it's important. I mean, one look at this cat, you know that there's a reason we need to, uh, to take action. But I need to review a little bit what, what the importance is on, um, for any patient that you see with any disease to concentrate on their pain. Uh, the vicious cycle of pain has been well documented and we talk about this all the time, but it's, it's worth taking a little bit of time to go over this cycle um, and what happens when we or an animal um, is in pain. That idea that there's this stress response, this neural humoral response to stress, which will increase AD, ACTH and cortisol, increasing the renin aldosterone system and ADH, which in turn decreases hormones like insulin and testosterone, which in and of itself is that decreases, that increases catecholamines, causing the cycle to go around and around and around again. And I mean, that's a really simplified version. And we can look at this a little bit more with a little bit more complexity here, uh, because we know it's been well studied in humans, um, probably not something that we in the veterinary 
profession talk about all the time, but the whole idea that pain is not just a physical uh, or a biological model, it's also a uh, what they consider the, that it is a biopsychosocial model. So there's not just the neuroendocrine changes and the activation of the sympathoadrenal um, uh, axis and the changes in neuroplasticity and inflammation, uh, but there's also the, the role that anxiety and fear pay, plays in pain. And we can relate this to our veterinary patients as well. And the idea that um, demoralization and immobilization can cause uh, physical as well as psychological factors, uh, ultimately leading to our patients dying. Uh, the pain kills and we know this. Uh, simply, what will you see in your patients? What you'll see in your patients is compromised immune function, slowed healing, um, increased morbidity and mortality after surgery, uh, increases in tumor growth, um, cancer cell growth when we have uncontrolled pain, and changes in the motor function, neurologic changes over time, especially with chronic pain patients. You may not be able to really put a finger on the psychological, the social and psychological factors uh, related to pain, but there's a lot more studies going on now in animals discussing that. And I'll show you towards the end of the presentation some of the things that we've looked at in animals where we've been pretty um, good at doing that in humans, talking about how the stresses of um, losing your job or or uh, people feeling like that you're not really in pain when you have chronic pain can affect the way that you deal with any kind of pain syndrome. So what is it? Why? That's, that's the, the reason, the relevance of why we, um, we look at pain and deal with treating pain. And I always show this study, if you've listened to me lecture before, you've seen this, I call this the duh study. Um, any, the idea that reducing pain has a benefit. And this became very popular when it was published in 2014. Uh, they did a little study and they looked at mice and they removed the TRPV1 receptor uh, and these mice felt longer. This one pain receptor, if they were able to remove it, these mice um, lived longer and um, and that was great. So woo, if we took away pain, they live longer. Duh, that makes sense. The thing that um, was most interesting to me about this study is it wasn't just that these mice live longer because we all say, I mean, you hear people joke about this all the time. We all say, um, yeah, it's okay to live longer, but I don't wanna live longer. I don't wanna live to be 90 and feel lousy. Um, the interesting thing is, is that it isn't just that they were living longer, it's that they were living longer and better, that they had better activity, that they had better motility, that they, that their coats looked better, that their, their aged life was not, um, immobile and was not, um, their quality was, was better, uh, so, so certainly this tells us, and we can extrapolate to our patients and say in clinical uh, life, when we're in a veterinary hospital, we can feel very comfortable knowing that if we concentrate on eliminating pain or reducing pain in our patients, we're going to have much better outcomes. Our patients are going to feel better. They're going to live longer. They're going to do better. Um, so how do we do this um, with our hospitalized patients? So traditionally, bed rest was the idea. Hippocrates, um, in his time, we always bring up Hippocrates when we talk about medicine, right? But Hippocrates, he wrote a lot of things down, which is great because uh, bed rest was prescribed. I always tell the story of my Pennsylvania Dutch grandmother uh, who talked about when she had a baby that she had to lie flat for so many weeks before she could even get out of bed. And so that was in the um, 1920s when she had her children. So the idea that 
that but still in what we consider kind of a modern era that she was um, told to have this strict bed rest after a painful episode. Um, but even Hippocrates, he wrote it down. He's like, I, I don't know. I, he, was, he was the first physician to recognize the potential harm of confining patients to bed. Um, and the idea that confinement can cause dehydration and cardiac deconditioning and postural hypotension and reduce oxygenation and lung function, which can lead to venous stasis and blood vessel weakening. All of these things uh, can occur with our patients if they are immobile and an altered dermal barrier as well. So muscle atrophy is one that I really uh, like to think about because it can occur at about 12% per week. Um, along with that altered skin integrity, all things that we really don't want to see if we keep our patients too confined. So what happens when we are confined and when we're not doing anything with our patients in the hospital? Besides pain, there's all kinds of physiological processes that occur. Um, let's look at the cartilage first. The, this is a great picture of cartilage in a lab that becomes uh, uh, atrophied. So uh, the promotion of, of tissue generation, degeneration occurs um, very quickly when we're immobile. Uh, decreased synovial fluid causes um, the less diffusion to the underlying cartilage, which in turn causes atrophy of the cartilage. And all of this will happen because we don't have weight bearing. We know that synovial fluid is really produced when we bear weight. And um, the problem is, is this cartilage atrophy won't, may oftentimes is not reversible when activity resumes. The other big thing that people don't realize is they think that activity is the main factor and the only way that we can cause that developmental um, problems in the cartilage where we have pitting and erosion and osteophyte formation, which is that vicious cycle of osteoarthritis. But disuse will cause that as well because of the, the importance of um, having synovial fluid and having weight bearing um, to keeping the cartilage healthy. Disuse and non-weight bearing will also continue that process, that other vicious cycle of cartilage degeneration and osteoarthritis. So that's bad news. And then we have the, uh, what happens in the muscle, the idea that if we don't use our muscles that they are going to atrophy and then we have uh, big problems with that. Because the muscle, we have two types of fibers, the type one fiber, which are the, the type ones are the ones that um, help us stand up. And they're the extensor fibers, weight bearing, and they're actually more prone to uh, disuse atrophy than those type two fibers. So you probably, when you see your patients in the hospital uh, that are down for long periods of time, maybe with neurologic disease, uh, that, that they still seem to have really good muscle function as far as flexion and um, twitch reflex and pinching and all this. But the idea that, um, that those type one fibers are going to lose strength very quickly um, can occur, 12% over a week. <clears throat> Ligaments will lose stiffness, the flexor tendons can go undergo contracture, and of course having decreased bone formation and increases in bone reabsorption because we don't have that mechanical loading. <clears throat> Remembering that um, the other thing that happens when we have this muscle atrophy isn't just that the muscles suffer, um, localized muscle, there are actually enzymatic changes in the muscle tissue, which can produce more reactive oxygen species, which we don't want to have, reducing contractility and reducing generation of muscle fibers. Again, things that we may not be able to reverse. So we're heading down a slippery slope if we don't just get our patients moving. So these are all the, the, the importance of why we need to think about being a little bit more proactive with options in hospitalized patients, whether in the ICU or if you're in a general practice. Animals that are in pain, whether surgical or medical, uh, that are not getting the proper care. And we don't have time to talk about pharma options, 
but I really do want to talk about adding some non-farm options to make things uh, more well-rounded in what we provide. But before I talk about it, I, I, about what we're not doing, I do want to celebrate what we are doing and the idea that we, that we are really taking uh, better care of our patients than when I graduated from veterinary school. Uh, I need to recognize this. I, we're, do, we're, we're, we're making great strides in pain awareness, which is my job uh, to teach you. But also, I, I, you're sitting there right now, um, veterinary technicians, nurses, doctors, you're sitting there and saying, we're, we're measuring pain. We're looking for pain. We are proactive. And these, this is a nice slide looking at uh, the uh, uh, veterinary hospital that has the Glasgow pain scales laminated to the back of the clipboard, the cat one on the cats and the dog one on the dogs, and having this way to assess our patients and be able to make this a part of your routine data gathering is so important and trying to do something about it. So here, this is Q2 hours, we're doing a pain score. Um, I do wanna remind you that when you have a pain score and you're seeing a trend to make sure that we're trying to do something about it in a multimodal fashion. Um, so it's great that you're measuring pain and you're doing this, but it's important to think about what we need to do if we're following a trend that it's getting worse or staying the same or even getting better, what you need to do about it. So there's two steps to doing pain assessment, right? Um, and, and we are, you're doing great, especially if you're in a really busy practice um, that has emergency and you're doing some awesome things, fentanyl patches, CRIs, lidocaine patches, syringe pumps, all kinds of things. We're doing fentanyl, we're doing, uh, we're doing all kinds of multimodal pharmacologic options for pain, which is great. This is wonderful and I do celebrate this. And this is where the objections come in. A lot of times if I were live and we'd be talking and I could get some input from you right now, I, I would see the, the, um, the CVTs raising their hands and saying, you know, doc, how can I do this? I have a patient on a ventilator. My hospital looks like this. Um, I have some really critical sick patients and that I'm doing Q1 hour treatments or I am assigned to this dog that's on a vent and I, how can I accomplish this? How can I get this done? And I, this is, this is some, some objection that we need to see. And I'm going to show you some, some thoughts, some, some research that's been done on the human side to suggest that probably um, if we if we provide a little bit better pain management, we're going to have better um, outcomes. We're going to get our patients home sooner. We're going to be able to um, reduce the chaos that we have with 17 patients in the ICU at a time uh, because they've done these studies in the human side. And I think we can extrapolate this data and maybe improve what we're doing in veterinary medicine as well. So there's the big objection. Let's look at this proof. Um, so they started to look about at this a lot in human medicine. And if you look, this first study, this was published in 2013. So it's still kind of new. Um, and uh, this was done at Johns Hopkins and, and mostly because they're constantly collecting data about the cost of hospital stay and mortality, morbidity and mortality of their patients. And this study looked at uh, post-intensive care syndrome in humans, which can occur after there's a critical illness and it can cause chronic physical, mental ailments in these patients after they go home. So we're thinking about really, really sick patients in the ICU. And what they found is that if they provided rehab or some type of rehabilitation in the ICU, what even while these patients were on life support, while they were while they were vented, you know, that may reduce the complications associated with this, um, this post-intensive care syndrome that they saw. So first good study that I think is something to think about. Okay, um, these are really, really sick patients and they're taking the time to provide therapy to them while they're still um, uh, intubated. <laughs> 
So uh, John Hopkins, uh, Johns Hopkins looked even further and they found that providing early re rehabilitation, even when a patient is on life support, continued to lead to better outcomes. And they, so in 2008, now this was published in 2013, and in 2008, they decided to create this early rehab program um, in their hospital, in their medical ICU. And that they hired two dedicated physical therapists. So that cost them to create this. This cost them over $350,000 a year. And I think that that's important to know that, yeah, you're going to, this, this is going to cost them something. And, and that was added to the ad, ad, annual cost of care when they're looking at the big picture. But what they found in one year that the average length of stay in the unit was down by 23%. Um, so that meant that the people that were critical were moved out of the ICU a quarter of the time, 23% time uh, faster. And also the time that these patients spent in the hospital overall in step down units um, decreased by about 18%. And of course, everything's about cost savings in human medicine. And I think that we veterinarians look at this too, um, that their cost savings was over $800,000 uh, to be able to utilize. And that's, that's along with adding in the $358,000 to hire these two people. And I think that this is a really le good, legitimate study to have us take pause and think about what we're doing. Uh, we're, we're able to get our patients home sooner. We're able to save pet owners money for sometimes very expensive hospitalizations. We're able to provide better outcomes and longer, um, uh, better quality of life and um, longer lives in general to these patients. So um, you, we do, we would like to see a veterinary study. And I mean, they've looked at, uh, you know, orthopedics and pain management and rehab all go together, right? So the idea that, um, that they looked at, and this came, Mike and Zemius did this at, at um, Iowa State, and they said, okay, we're doing CCL. I mean, they were looking at all kinds of things back in um, the early 2000s with cruciate surgery and whether we should do rehab or not. And so they looked at this study and they published it, and I'm sure you're all familiar. They said, okay, we're going to have dogs just get um, cruciate repair and dogs get cruciate repair and have physical therapy starting right away. And what they found was that the early rehab group uh, that began immediately had, um, um, had better, six months later, had much better um, limb function measurements. And they were significantly increased in both groups, but the rehab group six months later was much better. And it, by six months, you could not tell the difference between the surgical leg and the non-surgical leg, which is pretty awesome, right? But um, with, the, with the group of groups of dogs that did not have early rehab immediately after surgery, they had um, still a, six months later, a significant difference between the legs of dogs uh, in the exercise restricted group. So I think that that's just a little bit, you know, at the time that we have, that's just a little bit of proof to say, okay, maybe we should be much more proactive and not necessarily just with of orthopedics or just with our surgical patients, but also with any hospitalized patient, especially if they're in pain, which you can assume that they are. It was interesting. I just had a conversation with, um, with my daughter who uh, works emergency in the ICU and they had a dog that got into a beehive and um, the clinician, she's, she's um, a veterinary technician and the clinician, they're pulling these, these um, stingers out of this dog. The dog was shocky, they treated it for shock. And she said, do you think this dog is in pain? And um, the clinician said, oh, I don't think so. It's just a bunch of bee stings. And she said, you know, last time I had a bee sting, it was pretty painful. I mean, this process, even if it's an acute thing and something you think of that, that doesn't seem really painful, um, it probably is. Uh, dogs are just really, really good at hiding it. So let's talk about some solutions. 
ice. Everybody thinks about ice. This is something you probably do for all of your orthopedic surgeries that are in hospital. The idea of providing something that's non-pharma to go along with pharma uh, after surgery, this is great. The, that um, we can reduce pain because we can cause less muscle spasm and we cause vasoconstriction and we decrease nerve um, conduction velocity. We can also inhibit or slow down the production release of those pro-inflammatory mediators that happen after injury or surgery. So this is super. These images are of something really cool. This is a um, ice with compression device, which um, has shown to be even more effective, especially um, after um, a peripheral limb injury or surgery. So this is great. This is a great idea because especially for acute pain, this makes a lot of sense. This was just published, this study. This is Bonnie Wright and um, uh, um, B. Montero and Paula Stegall, and they, they um, looked at a lot of data um, on the, on, in the veterinary um, literature about using ice therapy. And uh, this just was published. It's, it's a really good article talking about how um, ice can be really effective, especially acutely. Uh, but why does it say that there's some complicated issues about it? Well, there's a lot of complicated data, especially on the human side, because look at what some still do to athletes, like those ice baths that they do with athletes um, uh, when they're chronically conditioning. And um, the, the validity of ice um, for chronic pain um, seems to be a little bit more uh, complicated. And we call this the ice controversy. And, I, and I will, I've been very interested in this because I, I have uh, a daughter who plays soccer in college. And the idea that uh, there is a controversy with using ice has come out of some research um, looking at um, crushing injury and what happens to the muscles at a microscopic level. So um, thinking about this, um, what they have found is that if we don't ice, yeah, we have all the pro-inflammatory stuff that happens. Those macrophages, those, they're, they're running in, that's where we get the swelling, we, we have this inflammation. Um, in the icing group, you have less, um, less of that, but because the muscle fibers are necrotic, it actually slows the healing process over time. So by day three, um, in the group that didn't get any icing, we're already having the injured muscle regenerate. But in the group that got ice, that we, it takes a lot longer. And these studies are out there just kind of looking at the idea that maybe ice might be great initially to help with pain, acute pain management after an injury. Nothing feels better than ice if you stick your hand on the stove or if you twist your ankle. But boy, oh boy, uh, maybe long term, it's not so great. So dealing with um, continued pain, this is not really helpful at all. And um, the one um, study that looked at this is looking at cold compression therapy on post-op pain and swelling in dogs after TPLO. And um, interesting at this, at 24 hours, there was a significant decrease in the pain scores and Glasgow, you know, VAS and Glasgow, and also lower pain threshold scores. There were less swelling and less lameness and better range of motion. But 14 days later, you couldn't tell the difference. There was really no significant difference between the two groups. So the way I think about it is that maybe ice is really great right away uh, because it can really help prevent that wind up pain phenomenon that may occur, especially because of all those pro-inflammatory mediators going into the site. But utilizing it longer than that, we may have better options. And there are a lot of other better options. We start out with things like warm therapy, just using warm packs. I mean, this is something that is really high maintenance though, because you have to have a technician sit there and use warm towels and hot packs and make sure we're not doing too hot. 
The nice thing is that superficial heating really helps um, prior to doing some stretching. So if you're in rehab and you know one of if your practice has a separate rehab, you could see these rehab appointments take forever. Um, that's not what I'm talking about. You doing with your hospitalized patients in the ICU or in the emergency room or whatever is you don't have time to do this. But the idea that it causes vasodilation and that it also helps reduce muscle spasm. It improves tissue elasticity. It helps everything relax. And then you can combine it with something like passive range of motion. So being able to do this to promote joint mobility and prevent contracture, improve that cartilage nutrition, because we talked about we need, the, we need that synovial fluid. And making sure that you get this done very soon after surgery, like right away. Like these patients, yeah, it's great to get your, your orthopedic surgeries um, out and, and on your CRI and comfortable post-op, but we have to start moving. Gone are the days that that immobilization was something that we wanted to do. And then you can combine something like this, stretching. You know, the idea that you do range of motion, passive range of motion, just moving the joints the way they should, but being able to go a little bit beyond, and then what the key here is a little bit beyond, not overstretching, but the idea that we go a little bit beyond range of motion. Acutely, this is gonna cause an immediate elongation of the muscle and tendon unit, but chronic stretching over time can actually help those sarcomeres being added to add length to muscle, which is a really good thing. And then other things you can do in the hospital and you, is getting your animal up. And this is part of nursing care that I think um, is, is often done, but probably if we do it a little bit more proactively, this is gonna make a lot of sense. When you are doing treatments on your patient and you usually have to get them up and take them outside or you have to move them to clean their bedding, uh, having them stand correctly with all four feet on the ground and being able to just bear weight is so important. And if they are very ill, uh, using something to bolster them, like a peanut ball, and that's a good time. You're flushing their IV, you're maybe giving them oral medicine, you're doing something, but at the time also using um, a little bit of more proactive approach to put them in a physiological normal position. So getting them in a way to bear weight and have a little bit of muscle memory is very, very helpful and is actually going to improve their pain status. Sometimes we worry because you get these patients up and their heart rate goes up and they seem to decompensate because it takes some time. But think about it, if you've been in the hospital visiting your grandmother who, who just had gallbladder surgery and all the, the nurse wants her to do is to move from the bed to the chair and stand there for maybe 30 seconds in an appropriate way. Each time it's gonna get better and this is important to think about with your patients as soon as they're in the hospital, not on day three. Encouraging balance and proprioception. This is great to do. We think about this all the time with our IVDD dogs, whether they've had surgery or not. These are things that you can probably accomplish when you're doing all your pharma treatments and when you're doing all the other things that you're doing um, without taking up too much time during your treatment schedule. Just having them stand correctly and um, condition and improving the use of, of the way of all four limbs. So let's talk about um, other things that we can do in the, in the hospital that make sense that are non-pharma pain options. Um, laser therapy comes up all the time. And I love to talk about laser therapy. I was one of the first to, to use this. Um, now everybody has a laser, but I'm always amazed at how I'll go into practices and I did do a lot of traveling and I'll go into a practice and we'll be going through anesthesia protocols and we'll be looking at what they're doing and we'll be looking in their, um, in their 
um, hospitalized patients in their ICU area and I'll say, do you have a laser? And they say, oh yeah, yeah, but it's over in rehab. We never use it. And um, it's funny, this is the place where you should use it all the time. We know that photobiomodulation creates a analgesia analgesic and anti-inflammatory effect, um, causes tissue repair, helps with tissue repair, and is a cell growth accelerator. It's actually a biochemical cellular response because it, the particular wavelength of light stimulates the photoreceptor on the mitochondria, and it works through cytochrome C to facilitate increase in ATP production. And that is, ha, has a lot of effects, but one of the big effects is it releases um, nitric oxide, which is normally bound um, when we have a sick cell. I always say when we're sick or injured or painful or something, our mitochondria is not working so well. And um, nitric oxide is bound and creating less of a, of, a um, formation of, of energy from that cell or ATP. So once the cell is doing what it's supposed to do, that nitric oxide becomes um, unbound. It's a messenger. It causes vasodilation, release of reactive oxygen species, and acceleration uh, over time of tissue repair and wound healing, uh, reduction in pain, reduction in inflammation, and an increase in microcirculation. And there's a lot of literature about, about photobiomodulation, lots of evidence. And this is where I would consider um, using photobiomodulation therapy in the ICU in place of warm therapy, um, and maybe even in place of cold therapy. Um, it creates all these effects uh, at a cellular level. Uh, the benefits are that it's pretty easy. It's not very stressful. In fact, it's really great with cats because you don't have to pill them so you can use it for all kinds of things. Um, you're able to treat daily because your patient's in the hospital and they're captive. Probably the biggest complaint that people have with laser is that it doesn't, it's, you can't get the owners to come back. And I, um, this isn't a talk about laser, but I don't think that the lasers that you send home with people are as effective, uh, mostly because of the dose that you're able to, um, the, the total number of joules are the most important thing besides the wavelength. Um, we can incorporate it for a multitude of indications. So I think of anything in the hospital that has an itis, pancreatitis, um, cystitis, um, pulmonary disease, like asthma, <laughs> anything, anything that has an itis is going um, is going to benefit. It does not interfere with other treatments. Um, it can help reduce stressful oral medications because on its own, it can be really helpful with um, all of these inflammatory conditions. And the downside is uh, you need to bring the patient to the hospital. So um, some evidence. Now they looked at this in humans and I love that they're starting to look at it in humans. The idea that, um, that um, they looked at it with, with human patients that had um, open heart surgery. So they, they wanted to know how feasible is it and how effective is it to use one, um, photobiomodulation on the incision after um, open heart surgery. So they looked at 100 patients post-op and they all had pain scores that were above, average was above seven. And 30 minutes after they extubated them, they did a, they did a treatment. And normally these patients get um, multimodal analgesia, which um, we all know these buzzwords. Uh, they get IV, you might be interested that humans, they get IV bolus of tramadol and they get acetaminophen. So they also have the ability to have rescue fentanyl if they need it. So the idea that they would get this laser treatment, half of them, and, or they, they would, and 24 hours later, they saw that um, only 40 of them out of the 100 received dose number two. So they decided that anybody that had a pain score less than five was only going to get that one dose. And two days later, 48 hours, no patient needed treatment number three, and none of them out of all 100 um, required any rescue analgesia, meaning that they didn't need the fentanyl. 
at all, which is pretty awesome. The incisional pain completely taken care of with um, one or two photobiomodulation treatments and their typical PURI procedure, uh, uh, multimodal analgesia protocol. So they also looked at people with wisdom teeth um, extraction. And I like this study because what they were worried about is, hey, should we provide photobiomodulation? And you may have some surgeons say, hey, I don't want you to laser this patient until tomorrow because I'm afraid it's going to bleed. Because for some reason, they think that uh, laser therapy will blow a clot off and they'll start bleeding again, but it does not. It does cause vasodilation, but it does not blow a clot off. So if they've, if they are a good surgeon and they've been able to stop bleeding during surgery, you will not have the patient bleed again. And that's what they were worried about in this study when they looked at um, removing um, uh, wisdom teeth and they said, okay, let's do laser on day one immediately. And then day three, and then wait on the other half and do them on day two and day four. And what they found was that it was um, much, both of them had significant reduction in pain in the lockjaw and that horrible swelling that you get um, after you have your teeth removed, wisdom teeth removed, but there was much more significant um, improvement in the immediate group compared with the delayed group, which is great news as well. So you're probably familiar with this study, looking at surgical patients um, at U UF and how they decided that traditionally their multimodal protocol for IVDD dogs did not include laser and usually 12 to 14 days until these dogs were ambulatory. As soon as they used um, photobiomodulation in the hospital, uh, these dogs were up and walking in three to five days, uh, consistently um, improved. A couple other places for you to think about it um, are things like the itis. Look at ch chronic pancreatitis and microcirculation. And, and this is, um, again, um, looking at humans, but I think we can extrapolate one of the most painful things that we see in the hospital um, is pancreatitis. And what they said was, what does laser do with pancreatitis? How does it help? Does it help? So they took these patients with chronic pancreatitis and they treat, they had, um, they had, um, patients that just received the typical medications that they received um, or patients that received photobiomodulation as well. And what they found is that, first of all, there's abnormal microcirculation in the pancreas, which they can measure with Doppler. So they were able to have a distinct measurement in these patients. Besides the patients telling them that they felt better, they were able to look at this microcirculation. They had the control group that were receiving the drugs that they normally receive, and the other group received those same type of drugs, but also photobiomodulation. And what they found was that the combination substantially improved that microcirculation in the pancreas that they could measure with the Doppler, and also um, didn't matter what type of pancreatitis they had, because in humans, they generally um, classify chronic pancreatitis as spastic or hyperemic or congestive. Um, that didn't matter. What mattered was that they were able to definitively see improvements um, in the microcirculation via Doppler. And um, this is a study um, wh where in Brazil, where they were looking, and this is pretty recent, where they were looking at the um, inflammatory lung model in mice, and they created this, but they were saying, okay, does photobiomodulation help at all in the lung tissue? So they created this inflammatory process, and think about it, what do we have that's inflammatory, asthma, um, uh, any kind of inflammatory lung condition. And what they found is that looking and being able to measure the amount of inflammatory cells and also measure cytokines that are produced, that laser reduced all, both inflammatory cell influx and also all the level of cytokines that they were able to measure and it did not affect the lung tissue at all. So the mice lung tissue was happy and was able to be as mechanical as it should be, but we reduced the inflammation.
and then I like to look show this study because although the the we're very very concerned about using photobiomodulation in animals that have cancer because in vitro we have no idea cancer cells are cells that are gone wild and in vitro if you put a certain wavelengths of light onto cancer cells they get worse and then some of them die um, but what they have found is pretty standard of care now um, in humans to utilize photobiomodulation for patients who do have throat and neck cancer that are getting chemotherapy and radiation because what happens as a side effect of those treatments is they get horrible um, mu mucositis which reminds me of very painful um, cats and the cat oral stomatitis. Uh, so they've looked at this a lot. This study was published in 2014. And then in 2018, the, the, in oncology, this has become pretty much standard of care. And this was an updated review that was published in 2018, looking at all the articles and looking at the years that they have done um, utilizing laser therapy for these patients. And they found that it's basically state of the art. It enhances patients' adherence to the treatment. Um, it improves quality of life. They gain weight. They feel better. They have less mucositis. They eat. Uh, they, they do much, much better. But again, the big problem is this is a very active modality. This is something that it's great for you to be able to um, utilize it and put it on your treatment sheet and once a day with your patients in the hospital. This is wonderful. And you can just add it in. Um, there's people, one of the questions um, I get, is there any benefit to doing it more than once a day? All the studies that have, uh, that have shown, uh, that we've looked at really haven't shown a benefit of doing it more than once a day, uh, except for really, really severe uh, inflammatory uh, conditions like burns that sometimes twice a day um, in the beginning might be good or snake bite, um, which can be quite painful, very, very helpful for that. But again, we have an even better option. The idea of using pulse electromagnetic field therapy just makes the most sense for a busy um, hospital and ICU because there's a lot of similarity um, and there's some benefits to using pulse electromagnetic field therapy uh, for, for our, um, our pets in hospital and out of hospital. So there's a tons of research in humans especially and recently, some really, really good studies are finally happening in veterinary medicine, which is great. So we know that it accelerates a reduction in pain and inflammation and wound healing in humans and regaining pain perception uh, and proprioceptive placement in dogs, improving wound healing and decreasing the use of rescue opioids in dogs and humans. Um, people are probably familiar with um, bone growth stimulators, because that's where people are thinking, oh, pulse electromagnetic field, is that when they put, put them on and try to see if we have um, bone growth stimulation or we have improvement in healing after fractures? And that's originally where it was um, utilized. Uh, the idea that we're talking about something targeted, where there's a targeted waveform, an active electromagnetic wave waveform that actually enhances the production of nitric oxide. And we talked about nitric oxide with laser therapy, but the whole idea that that is a really, really, really good signaling mechanism, really helps to reduce inflammation, really helps to increase microcirculation and vasodilation. Um, when they looked at this in vitro, it, with the standard model of inflammation, they found that TPMF is comparable to NSAIDs with, um, with inflammation. And in humans clinical trials, it correlated to the anti-inflammatory activity of NSAIDs and pain reduction. Uh, there's a really great um, research um, article. It's basically a review article that was published a few years ago by Jamie Gaynor, um, looking at all of the veterinary applications of pulse electromagnetic field therapy and specifically the benefits of targeted pulse electromagnetic field field therapy. And really, how does it work? Um, pulse electromagnetic fields are delivered by electrical currents to the tissue, really, really tiny ones. It's targeted, which is a specific waveform and frequency to stimulate the specific pathway, which is the 
calcium calmodulin binding. And targeted has been really well characterized with accelerating the endogenous pathway. Um, interestingly enough, and really great to know, especially when we were just talking about cancer where we don't know, this response to treatment is only observed in injured tissues and it does not by itself cause bone growth or tissue regeneration. Uh, there's also a lot of research going on and in humans as well right now talking about neuromodulation and the study of circadian rhythm and um, specific um, neurologic um, effects of it and different wavelengths that may help with um, neurologic problems as well. So all of this has been documented with neovascularization, bone healing, cyto decreasing cytokine release, um, and there are a lot of benefits to using this in veterinary medicine. One is it's really easy to use. It's very passive. It doesn't make any noise. They have no idea what's happening. You can incorporate this. This looks like the same list, right? You can incorporate it for a multitude of indications like any itis. It doesn't interfere with any other treatment. So truly multimodal and it can help to reduce stressful oral medications. You can incorporate it in the bandage and there really isn't a downside because you can have the owner take it home as well. Um, a couple studies, there's lots of human studies, a lot of boob studies. This is um, a study looking at people who had um, breast augmentation and they were using a, a, a PEMF in their wrap after having surgery and found that their pain scores were significantly lower. And um, besides that, they were using less narcotics, which is awesome. And more importantly, in people that didn't really need breast augmentation, but had a tram flap, and if you know anybody who has had breast cancer and decided to have a tram flap reconstruction at that time, really, really horribly painful surgery. And they studied using just in, in um, post-operatively in, um, in the wrap, significant reduction in interleukins, in wound drainage, and significant reduction in post-op narcotic use, uh, which is great. So how about in um, animals, which is nice to see. So this study looked at dogs that had intervertebral disc disease surgery, and um, they were able to measure um, a, a, what's called the plasmal glial fibrillary acidic protein. It's a spinal cord injury biomarker. And, uh, what we found was that there was really great improvement of proprioceptive placement and also significant reduction in the spinal cord injury biomarker uh, just with dogs that received PEMF. Uh, other group of dogs um, at AMC, they um, received um, PEMF therapy after their intervertebral disc disease surgery and they found, yes, opioids administered almost 50% less frequently, no side effects. Um, they used a placebo, so they used a sham loop and really had, um, because it was double blinded and randomized, this is a really good um, valid study to show that there was st statistically significant improvement in the wound healing as well as pain, post-operative pain. So I think that this gives you a lot of options to think about with creating a non-pharma multimodal program in hospital. And uh, as you see, the loop is really easy if you haven't used it. Um, using something like the, the clinica or the lounge in hospital is great because you're able to treat a patient uh, more effectively if they're in a confined area. And instead of treating on both sides of the applica 